All right, so today we're going to be going through uh, the last book of the Old Testament that we're doing an overview of. We're going to go through the book of Malachi. Who can tell me what Malachi means? I forget, you're all Hebrew speaking. Who can tell me what Malachi means? What's a Malach? And a Malach is an angel. So if I say Malachi, excuse me? So messenger would be Malach. Angel, messenger. So when I say, um, so if I say Avi, what am I saying? Av is father, if I say Avi, if I say Beni, if I say Adoni, <laughs> okay, when we say Adonai, what do we, what do we mean? Lord, okay, but more specifically, my Lord, Adoni, my Lord, so Adon, Lord, Adoni, my Lord. My angel, my messenger, right? Except with Adonai, we add, it's, it's more than just plural. I mean, it's, it's like God is one, but we know that he is kind of more than that. You know, he's like plural, so to speak. Not that he's three people. Don't get this wrong. This is a very bad way to describe it. But what I'm saying is we're putting more respect and more emphasis on it because we call, if you went to your boss and said Adonai, that would be absolutely normal. It's like saying sir. Um, or like your land lord. It's not weird. You don't, you don't consider him some like spiritual lord or anything. He's just the lord of the land. You know? So because we want to give more respect to God and because we know in the hidden meaning that um, it's not just the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Spirit, it's Adonai. Obviously the Jews don't necessarily know that, but it's interesting because if you look into the Zohar, it actually has some um, innuendo and implications that God is kind of like in three parts. But that's just for another day. Anyways, Malachi, my messenger, or my angel. There isn't really much said about Mal- Malachi or Malachi. We don't really know much about him, which leads some to believe this could have been an angel or you know, because it is the word for an angel. It's like when you look in Revelations, the letters to the angels, it says to the angel of the church in Ephesus and to the angel of the church in the other churches. Um, that word can be angel. It can also be messenger. So it could also be to the, like the leader or the, the guy who is a messenger at the church of Ephesus. So this word being Malachi or my messenger it reminds me a little bit of how each of us have a message of God that we're supposed to be bringing to the world. That God says, I will, he will make himself known through us. So part of the reason for the exile of, of Israel from the land is that through that exile, the world is going to get to see who God is. We're going to be a light to the world wherever we are. That's how the gospel message was going to spread. So it was kind of the plan for Israel to reject it so that it could spread, in a way. So what is the job of a messenger? To bring a message. Whose message? Okay, in this context, God's message. So let's give an example. Let's say you, you give someone a message. You send a messenger to somebody. What should they not do with your message? change it in any way shape or form right they should not interpret it because for that you need an interpreter maybe then you'll send a messenger and an interpreter but then how often do we interpret god's word to suit us or what we think it should say or what we're comfortable with doing we had a discussion just last week about how culture can sometimes inform 
what the church should be doing. If we grew up in a certain culture, then it's difficult to break out of the culture and do what the Bible says. So often, when we're looking at what the Bible says, we'll read it in the lens of our culture, which is a mistake, because then we're making our culture fit into the Word. But if we were raised on the Word, purely, without the culture, most of the things we struggle with, we probably wouldn't struggle with. If you never celebrated Christmas as a child, you'd never struggle with the fact that it's not in the Bible. And now I have to let it go. It's because you have such longing for it, you have such memories in it. Yes? Yeah, it's like that moment when Moses has to leave Egypt. Obviously, he had to leave because of his own um, sins, his own balagan, but it was good that he left. God used it for his good. And all that time while he's in isolation, not completely isolated, but away from the hustle and bustle, as you put it, God got to work with him and teach him how to be ready for the next step. I was having a conversation recently with someone who felt like their life was stuck. They're putting in 110% effort everywhere, work, home, um, family, and all of that, but there's no, not that there's no fruit per se, but the people she's reporting to are not seeing, it's almost as if she's underappreciated. It's almost as if it doesn't matter how hard she works, she won't get a raise, she won't get a well done or a congratulations, and it's like, why am I doing this? Maybe I should just quit. Maybe I should just look for something else. And the thing is, Seasons, sometimes we try to pray our way out of a season. We try to fast our way out of a season. Like let's say you're single and you're looking to get married and you're kind of like, you know, you, you fast seven days and like this has to happen. I'm not saying don't pray for marriage, but what I'm saying is if God has allotted a season for you to go through a wilderness or to go through a season of singleness, it's for a reason. And it doesn't mean that you are less of a person because you're single. It doesn't mean that only married people are holy and God can't use you because if that was the case, Yeshua was not holy or usable by God. You know, he was single, but he could be used by God in his singleness. There's certain things that a single person can do that a married person cannot do. You know, if I choose to do a Bible study till 11 at night, that's fine. I've got nobody waiting at home for me on some, where are you? You know, I'm, no, the women are lovely, they're amazing. I'm actually looking forward to the day when I get that call and it's like, guys, I'm sorry, gotta go, you know? I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Everything that people are like, I gotta apply for a visa, or oh, I'm on wife duty, and they mope. I'm like, I'm running towards that, you know, because I think that's a blessing. But anyways, point is, there's certain things you can do as a single person. If God's like, hey, go to India now, I can be like, okay, I don't have to, I don't have to ask anybody, you know? But then as a husband or as a wife, there's also blessings because there's things that you can do. As a husband, when your wife looks at you, she must see Christ. So if she reacts in a way that's unorthodox and she actually insults you and she does something very terrible, like what we do to Christ every day, you should react the way Christ reacts when you sin. So think back to your last sin and how that made him feel and how he didn't come and shout at you or make you feel bad he didn't say i knew you would do it he didn't say you always do this he didn't say any of that he was like it's okay just return to me and i'll return to you it's okay we don't have to have this thing between us and that's how we should be. So you've come home from work, you've had a long day, people try to kill you on the road, whatever the case might be, you get home, you're expecting a warrior's welcome, a hero's welcome, because you're working hard for the family and you, you braved it and you did it. And then instead, your wife is frustrated, she's angry, she's shouting at you. How you react in that moment shows her who Christ is. 
Well, it can show her, or it can show her who you are. But it's your calling, your irrevocable calling as a husband is to show Christ to your wife, to your children. So when you get home, I like the way this one pastor says it. He says, when he gets home, his job has just begun. It's not that he's left his job. No, now his job begins. Now he's going to pour into his wife. Now he's going to pour into his children. He's not going to me time it. He's going to be like, okay, let me be a dad and let me be a, a, a husband. That's what I'm here for. And if you're not there, I mean, if, if your role is to make money and bring it home, she can get a, a savings account for that or an investment account. Your role is more than provider. Your role is to be the, the shepherd, to be the covering, but also to be the direction, but also to be Yeshua in the relationship. And Yeshua doesn't count our wrongs. He doesn't count our wrongs. It's, it's amazing, really. It doesn't matter how many times we wrong him, he's still loving. There is nothing you can do to make Yeshua love you more. It doesn't matter if you fast 40 days, he, he still loves you as much as he's going to love you. It doesn't matter if you came from sin this morning, he still loves you as much as he's going to love you. You can't earn it, you can't upgrade it, it's there, it's there for you. All you've got to do is receive it and stop running. Which takes me to a verse in Malachi. If we go to, if we go to chapter, might be chapter 2, uh, excuse me, it's not that I am not prepared, I just, I brought the wrong, wrong laptop. Um, so I'm going to be speaking from the heart. All right, chapter 3, verse 7. Let's read verse 6 and 7. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 and verse 7. Okay. But because I, Adonai, do not change, you sons of Yaakov will not be destroyed. Since the days of your forefathers, you have turned from my laws and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says Adonai Tzvaot. But you ask, in what respect are we supposed to return? Can a person rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how have we robbed you? And then he goes on. Well, we might get into a bit more of it just now. But the thing I want to point out is that this book is filled with God pointing out your sin. And you're kind of like, but how is that my sin? There's a point at which we can become blind to our sins. I don't know if you've experienced it. Because when, when sin starts, it starts with a small thread. And it's like it's hardly noticeable. You kind of know it, but it's like it's so small. I mean, come on, does God really mind? And you just tug at it, tug at it, tug at it. But Isaiah said, says, woe to those who start by pulling sin with a thread. And then they end up carting it off like with a rope. Because that's how it goes. It starts small and subtle. Next thing you know, you're, you're literally dragging it along with a rope. And by then, you've, you've blinded yourself so much to it that you don't see it. You genuinely don't see it. It's okay. I'll give an example. Okay, so maybe this one is a bit controversial. Let me start here. So if you were in Israel today, we've got a couple people who are in Israel today. It is not normal. This is not normal. Driving to synagogue, it's not normal. And you would find people walking everywhere to synagogue and to the Western Wall or wherever they're going because they just, they don't use their cars on Shabbat because of various reasons. We'll get into that another day. But now, here's the thing. We, we use our cars on Shabbat, but the motivation, the idea behind it is that I'm going to see God. I'm going to meet with God Therefore, the rabbinic tradition to not use my car is not as strong as the commandment to gather. God has instructed us to gather, so 
A man said, don't use a car. God said, gather. I'm going to gather. And we overrule the rabbinic tradition, the rabbinic commandment, because it kind of coincides with what God said. But then we leave church, and it's like, oh, but there's a birthday party there. So I'm just going to drive there. And then, you know, not working, but your motivation has changed now. And the thing is, we've been doing it so long that it's okay. It's like, I can do anything on Shabbat as long as I'm not working on work. And then next thing, you're playing golf. Next thing, you're, you know, you're swimming lanes. And it's like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just resting. I'm just like enjoying it. I'm not saying you can't get into the sea on Shabbat or something like that. But what I'm saying is, where is your focus? Where is your focus? If Yeshua came to visit, let's say when Vince and everybody come back, they come back with Yeshua and he comes and he visits our church. Ne? And he's here for the first service and maybe he stays for the parashat discussion in the afternoon. Where do you go when Jesus is here on earth? Are you going to say, oh, I'm quickly going to go to the baby shower? When Jesus is here on earth, can you justify that really? Is he going there with you? Where are you leaving Jesus when you go to the baby shop? So sometimes you need to take a step back and say, because God is saying, look, you have turned away from you. And they keep asking, how have we done this? It, it keeps on happening. He says, you have robbed me. How have we robbed you? If you have promised yourself to God, you better give yourself to him. Otherwise, you're robbing him. If, if he doesn't have your time, if he doesn't have your heart, if he doesn't have your attention, you are robbing him. Can a man rob God? Yet you rob me. Now, verse 9. A curse is on you, on your whole nation, because you rob me. The context here is tithes and offerings, and it's directed specifically at priests, so I'm not going to imply different things, but look at the principle. The principle is that there's something owed to God that you are not giving him. Why? Because you've justified the reason you do what you do. I'll put it this way. Okay. Sometimes we'll be like, okay, the Bible says don't cook on Shabbat. Okay. But I'm going to make some toast. Why are you making toast? Oh, you know, it's just you put it in the machine, you press the thing, and then, you know. It's, I mean, I'm not cooking, am I? Oh, okay. And then, next thing, you're making some eggs. Why are you making eggs? Well, I mean, I'm just frying it quickly while the toast is in the toaster. It pops up, and then, you know, you've got the toast. It's like, okay. And then, next thing you know, you've got this lavish sandwich. When your children are growing up in that environment, they don't see don't cook. Have you done something quick that hasn't really taken your attention? Yes. But they're not seeing don't cook. They're seeing, well, if it's quick enough, I can do it. So in other words, if I can open up my laptop quick enough, quickly check what my boss said and then close it, it's fine. And then maybe he just needs me to press send. And then that's it, okay, and then it's fine. It was quick, right? Isn't that how we justify making a quick toast or a quick um, sunny side up? We say, well, it's not taking much time, but are you fearing God? Or are you justifying why this is a good idea? Are you catching what I'm saying? If I'm, if I'm legalistic, then so be it. But I think um, somebody should tell me, in love, please, and, and I, will, I will take correction. But I think that if we don't, if we don't, let the word be the center. If our opinions, remember Malachi, give the message, don't interpret. Don't be God's PR guy. I like the way that this one pastor said, he's like, we're always trying to be PR for Jesus because people aren't ready to hear what he wants to say, so we want to make it sound better. Don't be the PR guy. If they don't accept it, you move on. That's what the disciples did. That's what Jesus did. He didn't beg anybody to enter the kingdom. He died for them. He loves them, but he's not going to follow after them and try and convince them that this is the way. If they're not ready, they're not ready. 
Wipe the dust off your feet, type of thing. Which, since you brought it up, I just want to explain what that means. They did it back then as a, as a sign, as a message. It wasn't necessarily that you must now, if someone disagrees with you, just wipe the dust off your feet. But it means, uh, so what, what, the, what the Israelites would do when they're leaving a Gentile city is they will wipe the dust off of them. It was a tradition that they did. They're kind of like, I'm leaving an unclean place, I'm going into a clean place. So I'm wiping even the dust from the Gentile place as I go into the holy place. That was like a, a thing that they did. So now, the sign that the disciples are doing is to say, I'm treating you like a Gentile. I'm treating you like you are outside of covenant because you have rejected the word of Adonai. His Messiah has come, you have rejected him, so you've rejected God. So okay, I guess that means, and it was more of a sign to them than to tell you to literally dust yourself off when someone doesn't listen to you. Who knows the code? <coughs> Okay, so let's, let's take a step back. All right, so Malachi. And there's a message, and it's God's message. You don't have to like the message, but it's God's message. The important thing is to fear God. And if we fear him, let's, let's put it this way. Okay, I was convicted so, so greatly. I have this tendency of wanting to wing it. Uncle Al has gently placed me under the bus a couple times and allowed the bus to... No, I'm no joking. He stopped, the, he stopped the bus before it came. But then... And the thing is, there's been moments where we just... We're at a place, you know, and we just feel like singing. We've got our guitars and we, and we go for it. And it's amazing. Like, God is in it and people are dancing and it's just, it's wow, you know? So we did that a couple of times. We had this like synergy and it was like pretty cool. So I kind of took that a bit too far to the point where it's like, no, we never have to practice. Now we're good. Like we'll just, we'll be fine. Are we good enough musicians not to be proud? But I think we can. That's why God could use us. But that's not the point. The point is not, am I good enough to wing this? Because that's pride. The point is, if the president said, hey, this coming Tuesday, I'd like you, to, you and Uncle Al to come and play a set. We would not go there unprepared. There's no way. There's no way I'd be like, hey, let's wing it. You know, unless like unforeseen circumstances and you know, traffic and this and that. Okay, if there's nothing we can do about it, well, we, we'd go ahead. But we would plan to practice. And that's just the president. So I would honor the president more then I honor God, and I was like, Phew. so that, that cut me a bit deep, because <clears throat> it's like, what am I doing? This is the king of the universe, and I just come haphazard, you know, on some, I can, I can do this. On that note, I'm not taking shots here, but I'd like you to think about this. If you come out bruised, I promise it's not me, but listen, okay. Is it okay that when you come to a funeral, you dress up formal? You're all kitted up, belt, shirt tucked in. And when you come to God, you kind of, eh. Now, I just want you to think about it. You're honoring the dead more than you're honoring the living God. Just think about it. If, and this is not everybody, some people go to a funeral in casual and it's like, hey, what's the big deal? Okay, I get that. And I don't think there's hypocrisy there, but I'm just saying, if you would put more attention and care into how you attend a funeral, I mean, even when we're attending a non-believer's funeral, we still go informal. If you're going to say that, no, this person's not really dead, he's alive, okay. Even for a non-believer, even non-believers when they come into church for the only time in the year on a funeral, they dress informal. And then you come to church to the living king and you don't respect him. You respect the dead more. I'm just saying, chapter 1, verse 6, it says this. A son honors his father. Let me wait while pages are turning.
It says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. But if I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me? Says Adonai Tzvaot to you, Pochanim, who despise my name. This is written to priests, specifically, because of how they were handling their position as priests. Later on in chapter 2 it says, because you have turned away from the path, other people are failing at the Torah. How you behave as a leader is going to influence how others can follow. If you set the bar here, I mean, who's going to try to pass that bar? It's enough for a student to be like his master. So how important is it as a leader, even of a house, of a family, or of a business, to set the bar high? Not legalistically, not pharisaically, but according to what God has said. Fearing him. Saying, you know what, I can't go through with this. No, I'm not going to that place. I can't, I can't come see you. you. I have a blind spot when it comes to you. I've got a weakness there. Or whatever the case might be. Where is the honor due God? Let's continue reading. Verse between, in the middle of verse 6. If, if I'm a master, where is the respect due me? Says Adonai Tzavah to you, Kohanim, who despise my name. I remind you, we're a kingdom of priests. So this message is to you. You ask, how are we despising your name? By offering polluted food on my altar. Now you ask, how are we polluting you? By saying that the table of Adonai doesn't deserve respect. So that there's nothing wrong with offering a blind animal as a sacrifice. Nothing wrong with offering an animal that's lame or sick. Try offering that animal to your governor. And see if he will be pleased with you. Would he receive you? Asks Adonai Tzavot. So if you pray now that God will show us favor, what your actions have accomplished is that what Adonai uh, asks. Will he receive any of you? Why doesn't even one of you just shut the doors and stop this useless lighting of fires on my altar? I take no pleasure in you. If I can translate that, I know we shouldn't interpret the message beyond what God is saying, but just to make that relevant to today. Let's just shut down the church. What's the point of singing? What's the point of coming if your sacrifice is not a real one? You know, Paul says, be a living sacrifice. Offer yourselves up as a living sacrifice. So if your sacrifice is not a real, pure sacrifice, if you're holding something back, what's the point? Let's close the church. Yeah. That's another point, yeah. So you haven't made right with your neighbor, and yet you're bringing your sacrifice. You're singing to God, you're praising him, but you haven't made right with your neighbor. Can he really accept that sacrifice? Let's, let's make it a bit more realistic. Okay, let's say, let's say, let's talk about the president again, or your boss. Let's say your boss has a wife and you've upset the boss's wife. Like when Haman upset Esther. Okay, so he's furious. Now, you haven't made right with Esther, and you want to come and speak to the king. Is it going to work out for you? Can you approach your boss when his wife is upset with you? Is this not the bride of Christ? And if you upset your neighbor, and now you want to come to the king, but you, you upset his bride. Similar thing. Thanks for that. So these are some, some things that I've been grappling with. And I'd just like to put it to you. I'm open to correction. I'm, I don't have the monopoly on truth. But when I read it, this is what I'm getting. I'll give this example. Okay. I understand in this church why we have things set up the way that we have set it up. When I say this church, I mean literally this building. Because before this building, things were a little bit different. Before this building, on Shabbat, we would have coffees and things like that. But the house in which we were meeting, many people can testify to this, the kitchen was dear Makar, on Shabbat. We just let it be. It's kind of like, hey, it's Shabbat. You know, I mean, you want, you've, you've used a cup, okay, in the, in the hall that we'd meet, you could quickly rinse your cup, but it's not like 
We're going to now clean the kitchen. We're going to now sweep this and do that and do that. You let it be. You spill something, okay, we're going to mop it up. We're not going to be pedantic. But we're not going to do dishes on Shabbat. Now what happens, we're here, we're at this church. Someone who's new to Torah comes in. They see Uncle Al, maybe they see Bruce, they see the leaders quickly. Oh yeah, I'm on duty today. Just doing all these cups. After that, then you start mopping. Okay, then you come through and you start picking up the stuff on the floor, on the carpet. And then we go. They're like, oh, okay, so that's cool. I can do that now. So then they go home and they wash their dishes. They do the whole thing. And they clean their house. And they clean the kitchen. And they don't stop. Because, I mean, if the leader's going to do it, why can't I do it? What standard are we setting? Is it really necessary? I'm not taking shots here, but is it really necessary to wash dishes and clean the kitchen on God's day? Is that fearing Him? Or is that fearing the next day? Is that saying, guys, okay, we can't wait until sunset, and then we have to stay here the whole time, and then only we can clean? So, convenience. We're not fear fearing God because of convenience? Because if I came into your house and I just started mopping things up and, and cleaning and seriously doing your kitchen, I think you would stop me, or you should. You should be like, hey, we don't do that here. Rest. Would you like a cup of coffee? You know? But in God's house, we have brought this in. We're working. We've got duty lists. Someone joins our group and they see a duty list on Shabbat. It's like, what? Shabbat? So, I'm saying, where is the respect due Adonai? Do we really fear him? Do we really fear his Shabbat? In Israel, they fear God so much, there was a time when they will lie on the street to stop you from driving. It's like, if you want to drive, you'll drive over my dead body. Literally. Where is your zeal? How do you bring the Jews to jealousy when you're doing this? A Jew walks in here, sees what we're doing, you've lost him. Let's say Christ appears to him and he's like, listen, you know what, I am the Messiah. And he starts to believe and he's like, okay, show me a congregation. And he comes in here, he sees this, it's like, this is, this is not Torah. Let's put convenience one side. We've got so many committees. I'm sure we can make a committee to clean after Shabbat. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Like, I don't think there is nobody in this church who is willing to do that. And I think sometimes we go for the easy route instead of fear God, honor God. And this is Malachi's job here. It's to speak to people who think they're doing nothing wrong. He's like, you are, you are not honoring me. How are we not honoring you? You are robbing me. How are we robbing you? And if you're asking yourself the question, how are we not keeping Shabbat? Case in point. Case in point. Last example, maybe. And I'm speaking to myself here as well with all of these things. We're a body. Your lips. What are your lips doing on Shabbat and can they do better are you speaking about your neighbor in a way that you shouldn't be are you speaking about the game are you speaking about your job sometimes you can speak about the job and say hey you know what God really helped me this week I had an issue and then God solved it for me Baruch Hashem that's a testimony that's not speaking about work there's a difference but then if you're like, yo, I'm so stressed, I don't know what I'm going to do. You can be the difference that says to your friend that when they say that, let's pray about it. Let's pray that God will actually make a way for you next week and redeem the conversation. Because sometimes we're too afraid to correct people. Because if we correct them, then they're going to go away or they're going to hate us or whatever the case. Jesus corrected people all the time. John the Baptist, he's like, who told you guys about the coming punishment? call people broods of vipers. I mean, does that sound like a church? It's either we're going to speak the truth in love or we're just, we're doing tolerance. We learned tolerance this week. I'm so glad I attended. 
I was at a Bible study this week and we learned tolerance. And what the world has made us to become is that unless I accept everything you say and I celebrate everything you say, I'm not tolerating you. So to be tolerant, I must accept you and celebrate your ideas, even if I disagree with them. That cannot seep into the church. We cannot tolerate sin. Paul kicks a person out. He's like, listen, hand that person over to Satan. He doesn't say, you know what, no, let's love him. Let's, this is loving him. Because his soul may be saved if we do this. But if we continue to coddle, how is he going to turn? Right, so. <clears throat> All right. So let's go through a couple of things. The lips of a priest. So, ki sipte kochen yishmeru da'at. The lips of a priest should guard knowledge, should preserve knowledge. That word is shamar. It's the same. It's the same word when God says, "You shall keep the commandments." As a Christian mindset, when you hear, "You shall keep all the commandments," what that sounds like is you need to get hundred percent in everything. But that's not what the word shamar means. The word shamar means you will protect it. You will watch over it. You might get things wrong, but the thing is, you're not getting it wrong because you're trying to. The point is, you're human. Sometimes we sin. First John says, if anyone thinks he is without sin, he is deceiving himself, and he's calling God a liar. So we do sin. We all have sin. But the point is, you are protecting it, which is what Adam was doing with the garden. He was protecting it. That's where it shows up. He was cultivating it to watch over it, to preserve it. So when someone comes and says, I want you to do this to God's commandment, you're like, mm -mm, I'm protecting this thing. I'm watching over it. I am the God. The God as in G-U-A-R-D. I'm guarding over this thing. You do not want a coward to be your bodyguard. God does not want cowards to watch over his Torah. You must preserve the knowledge, preserve it. So when someone tries to get you to break it, you say, no, I'm guarding this thing. I'm standing watch. And you can't make me move from my post. Is it clear? So, something that I'd just like you to introspect yourself. Next time you catch yourself speaking something you shouldn't be speaking on Shabbat, what do you do? Do you casually continue on some, well, they're going to be weird if I now change it now. Because sometimes we do that. But that's not loving. Who is the loving parent? So, scenario A, the child does something wrong, and you don't want to hurt his feelings, so you just kind of like, it's okay. Or scenario B, the child does something wrong, and you punish. Who is the loving parent? The punishing one, right? So love is not about how I make people feel. Is that correct? So even if I don't like how it makes me feel, and you don't like how it makes you feel, it can still be love. You don't have to feel good for me to love you. Are we, are we together? Okay. So let's go through the breakdown of the book. Basically, God raises problems and then he gives a solution. Most of the problems they are blind to. But this is how the book begins. The book begins with God saying, I have loved you. That is the message. I have loved you. And yet you ask, how have you loved me? Because your definition of love is, I must have 13... I must have 13,000 in the bank after I've paid everything. I must just have a cushion, you know, that I don't know what to do with. That's your definition of love. Your definition of love is everything at work must go great. Or I must have a job now. Then God loves me. Or my children must do everything I say without batting an eyelid. 
We've set these expectations which are not biblical to say that if God loves me, surely this will happen. The most righteous man on earth, well, second to Yeshua, Job, he would have failed that test. But he was so righteous that even when everything was crashing down on him, he didn't let that define God's love for him. So if you find yourself asking God, if you really loved me, wouldn't I have this? Wouldn't this be happening? Stop asking that. He loves you. Listen to how he explains that he loves you. So let's go to chapter 1. Let's read from verse 2. I love you, says Adonai. But you ask, how do you show us your love? Adonai answers, Esav was Yaakov's brother. I'm going to read it with the, with the English turn off. Esau was Jacob's brother. Yet I loved Jacob, but hated Esau. I, make it, I made his mountains desolate and gave his territory to desert jackals. Edom says, we are beaten down now, but we will come back and rebuild the ruins. Adonai Zivaot answers, they can build, but I will demolish. They will be called the land of wickedness. The people with whom Adonai is permanently angry. You will see it and say, Adonai is great, even beyond the borders of Israel. Okay. So, God says, I love you. And this is how he shows us his love. He points back to Jacob and Esau. So, let's read, okay, verse 2. No, so not, not verse 2. Where is it? Yes, it is verse 2. The end of verse 2. No, it's verse 3, sorry. It says, I loved Jacob yet I hated Esau. God hated Esau? Why did God hate Esau? And how does that show us that God loves us? Excuse me? He traded in his birthright. He traded, he despised his birthright. What does the birthright represent? Especially then. Hmm. Okay, it is the inheritance of the father's estate. So the, the firstborn birthright, you get a double portion of that inheritance. But then you have a responsibility to take care of everybody. It's not a double portion just to say, hey, you're the special one. Go and have your house in the Hamptons, wherever you want to live, and forget everybody. No, you, you now make sure everyone's taken care of because you have the double portion. So you have to be responsible. You have to make decisions you might not like because you, you know, it's not about you, it's about the family. So what does it mean if Esau despised that right? He didn't care for the He didn't care. He didn't care for his father's children. Why must Esau beg his brother for soup when his father's rich and has servants and all this? Isn't it because they didn't respect him? Because he was like never there? And because he despised that role? Let's bring it to the church. So actually before the church, let's talk about... So Abraham has a covenant with God. So part of the birthright that comes to Isaac is the wealth, but it's also the covenant. Correct? So he's not only despising responsibility to take care of others, he's despising his role in God's kingdom. His role as someone who has to be in covenant with God. You know, sometimes we shirk off responsibility. Like someone wants you in leadership, they say, hey, could you please take care of this? Hey, could you please teach the kids? Could you please do what? And we kind of don't want to do it because that means now I've got to actually live right. If I'm not in leadership or anything, then I can kind of do what I want and get away with it. Truth is, you're not getting away with it. The whole body is suffering because of your sin. Because we're a body. When Israel sinned after Jericho, God did not say, Achan has sinned. Achan was the person who actually sinned. But God said, 
you have sinned, Israel has sinned, even though it was one person's sin and people died because of his sin. So what I'm saying is, do you despise your role in God's kingdom? Maybe God's calling you to take some sort of responsibility in this house. And you're kind of like, meh, you're being like Esau. But now let's go a step further. How many times do you despise that responsibility or righteousness, doing what is right, for a moment of pleasure? You know what I'm talking about? You, you, it's like the, it's, it's the bowl of stew. It's a, it's a temporary thing. You're going to get hungry again. He's like, listen, I'm going to sell my whole birthright forever. And my, my role, and my, I'm the chosen one, I'm going to get the covenant, I'm selling all of that for a bowl of stew. How many times do you say, God, I don't value this life you've given me, I'm going to get a temporary pleasure. And then to make it worse, you pray before you do it. God, forgive me for this sin I'm about to do. You cannot repent before the sin. That's like taking an animal to the, sacrifice, to the altar. You're like, okay, let's sacrifice this thing. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm repenting. Then you go and you do the sin. Then you come back and say, okay, I'm repenting. How many animals are you going to kill? You're just murdering that animal. You're not, that's not a sacrifice. So the next time you're about to choose a temporary pleasure over keeping God's covenant, think about that. Right. Let's read chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, priests, this command is for you. If you won't listen, if you won't pay attention to honoring my name, says Adonai Tzavah, then I will send the curse on you. I will turn your blessings into curses. Yes, I will curse them because you pay no attention. What God is saying is, okay, you bought a car, Baruch Hashem, I'll turn that into a curse. Okay, you bought a new house, Baruch Hashem, I'll turn that into a curse. Okay, you're engaged, Baruch Hashem, I'll turn that into a curse. Because you're not paying attention. I will curse the blessing. I will reject your seed. Now it's more than you. Your children are involved now. What's the point of this relationship that you're in if the children you have are going to be rejected? Why? Because you don't pay attention. It's not saying that they don't have their own choice to make with God, but it's saying they're not going to be included in the covering of blessing. God is going to reject them because of you. I think this is a, a really a message, especially to the leaders, that are we really paying attention? And that could be a leader in your home, in the church, at work. When a person sees you, do they see Christ? Do they see Torah? Or do they see compromise? Do they see excuses? Do they see, surely God wouldn't mind? Okay, let's move on. Verse 3, I will reject your seed, I will throw dung in your faces, the dung from your festival offerings, and you will be carted off with it. Then you will know that I sent you this command to affirm my covenant with Levi, says Adonai Tzavot. What does Levi mean? Lev means heart. You could interpret Levi to be my heart, you could. But what does Levi mean? Surface level. When, when Leah bore Levi, what did she say? So Levi was the third son. She was like, okay, I've just given him my third son. Surely now, what? So I didn't hear? 
Yeah, he will be joined to me. Surely now he will love me and he will be joined to me. Levi means joined. So now God is saying, I had a covenant with Levi. I want to affirm this covenant. Are you joined to me? Do you have my heart? Do I have your heart? Verse 5. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave him these things. It was also one of fear, and he feared me. He was in awe of my name. When last did you fear Adonai? Growing up, up, my dad has never hit me. He's never had to. I think maybe he should have sometimes, but I think that. But he's never had to because his look was enough. If he just, yo, there was this look. And I just feared, yay, I don't even want to know what this beating is going to be. I'm in line. It's okay. Don't worry. So he's never had to. My mom, she, yeah, she's beat me a couple of times. But my dad never had to because of the fear. To this day, I don't want to experience it. Obviously, he's not going to hit me now, but I still have that thing where it's like, hey, I'm talking to my dad here. And I don't, want to, I don't want to meet that side of him. How often do you think of God that way? Do you fear your earthly dad more than you fear your heavenly dad? How often do you pause and think, if I do this, dad's not going to be happy? Because that's who he is. He's your dad. He's not the president or just some faraway ruler. He's your dad. And he loves you. Fear him. I promise you, you will only reap good reward. There's this song I know. The lyrics go, I turn my eyes toward your instruction and this will be its own reward. And then it says, I, I, sorry, hold on. (laughs) I keep my eyes sorry, oh yeah, I've, I've got, I forgot how it goes but then there's this part, the chorus goes I, I keep my eyes upon your kingdom so that my feet run straight to you what you behold is what you will do is where you will go anyone who's raced in like motorbike racing will tell you if you're looking there at that rock you're going to hit that rock you need to look where you're going and then you'll go there So, if your eyes are not on the kingdom, you're not heading toward the kingdom. If your eyes are on your spouse, if your eyes are on the person you'd like to marry, if your eyes are on your kids, if your eyes are on your job, you are not heading towards the kingdom. I guarantee you. And you're going to be so shocked. You're going to be like, Lord, but but we attended Shabbat. We, We did all those things. You know, we gave to the poor and we like, we prophesied and we did this. We opened up our home for Bible study. How, what do you mean we're not getting in? We're like, I never knew you. Because the whole time you were claiming to be in a relationship with him, you were beholding somebody else. That's like walking on a date and, you, and here's your girl, but you're looking this way. It's blatant disrespect. What? You're going to continue on that date. How many girls in here, you're walking with a guy and he's looking at another girl. You're going to continue going. Please put your hand up if you would do that. Okay. So you expect God to do that? Let's keep going. Verse 6. We're going to wrap up now. Verse 6. The true Torah was in his mouth, and no dishonesty was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many away from sin. The true Torah was in his mouth. Not the fake Torah, not the Torah based on how you feel, not the Torah based on what everybody else is doing, If you have to be that one person who's going to say, nah, I'm not doing it, be that one person. Samuel was. It amazes me that when Samuel was was, was prophet, the high priest was not leading the way he should. He was not disciplining the rest of the leadership. The rest of the leadership were doing things that they shouldn't be doing with the women. 
and using, I like the way someone else put it in our fellowship, they said that he was using God's altar as a bride stand for himself. Despising the sacrifices and despising God's name. That was the condition of the leadership. Yet God still spoke through Samuel. And God did not tell Samuel to remove the leadership. Samuel didn't say, hey, I'm going to find a different Israel because this one is not working. When the people were sinning, Moses didn't say, oh God, uh, you know what, I'm finding a new people. In fact, God offered Moses. He said, listen, Moses, let's make a new people. You don't like this church? Okay, I'm going to kill this church. Okay, imagine God says that. It's like, okay, let's, let's kill everybody. I'll, then, you know, you and your husband or you and your wife, you guys make some babies, you guys will be the new church. Some people might say, yeah, let's do that. But Moses said, no. They've sinned, but I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to intercede for them. When is it the right time to leave a church? When God tells you. Not when leadership is running amok. Not when things aren't happening as they should. That's when you pray. That's when you fast. Because we're a body. So if you walk away from this body, don't you know you're going to the same body down the road? And you think Christ is going to be like, oh yeah, well done. You've left that body defenseless now. Because you don't like what's happening. I don't think Samuel liked what was happening either. But he didn't take matters into his own hands. Neither did Jesus, by the way. Jesus was here. 33 years, 33 and a half. He didn't depose the high priest. He didn't depose the king. The time for that is coming. Right now, do what you have been called to do. That's it. What did God call you to do? If it's to come and open doors, come and open doors. If it's to greet people, greet people. Do it with love, do it with zeal. If it's to organize stuff, organize. If it's to pray, pray. If it's to fast and intercede, fast and intercede. Do what you were called to do. Don't hang back because we're a body and we need you. We need you. Everybody here has come with something to offer to the body. You might think you're insignificant, but you're not. You have something that God has put in you that's for everybody's benefit and for his glory. So when you're not here, we're one man short, one woman short. When you're not praying, someone is experiencing the week tougher than they should be experiencing it because you're not praying. Okay, so... If I could say, what is the theme of this book? We didn't really get into the breakdown. Um, I'd say the theme is, be God's messenger. Don't change the message. Preserve the Torah in your lips. Preserve it. Protect it. Guard it. Watch over it. For those who are studious Bible students, I'm going to go through the overview. This book was written roughly around 400 BC. That presents, okay, well, I'll, I'll come back to that. It was written roughly around 400 BC and it has three chapters, four depending on your Bible. It starts out with God's love for his people as we read before. Then it speaks about the sins of the priests, the leaders. Then it speaks about the sins of the people. And then it goes on and speaks about the coming messenger and how we have robbed God from tithes and offerings and how we have robbed him also of our service that is due him. Then it sums up with the day of the Lord. Everything is building up towards the day of the Lord. Now, God loves you. This is why this message is here. Peter puts it this way. If the world, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, let me not paraphrase. Let me be a messenger. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Okay, so we've got about 
80 seconds left. I'd like to read the whole chapter, but we don't have a lot of time. Um, can I read the whole chapter? Okay. Dear friends, I'm writing you now this second letter. In both letters, I'm trying to arouse you to wholesome thinking by means of reminders so that you will keep in mind the predictions of the holy prophets and the command given by the Lord and Deliverer through your emissaries. First, understand this. During the last days, scoffers will come, following their own desires, and asking, where is this promised coming of his? For our fathers have died, and everything goes on just as it has since the beginning of creation. But wanting so much to be right about this, they overlook the fact that it was by God's word that long ago there were heavens and there was land which arose out of water and existed between the waters. And that by means of these things, the world of that time was flooded and was flooded with water and destroyed. It is by that same word that the present heavens and earth, having been preserved, are being kept for fire until the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. I want to speak about that image quickly. I learned something yesterday. I'm not a big farmer. I want to get into farming. If you've got a farm and you need some help, call me. I want to learn. But anyways, they burn stubble at the end of the harvest season. You guys have seen this, where there's just these fires, and like, who started this fire? That's what I used to say, because I didn't get it. Sometimes it's just a fire that you shouldn't have started, but sometimes it's because it's a farmer, and he is preparing for the next harvest, or the next season. At the end of the harvest, he burns everything that's left over. It's called stubble. And so just all these rows of wheat and grain, whatever, that's like, it's not really the wheat anymore, but yeah, it gets burnt. And that destroys any diseases that may be there, destroys any weeds, anything that you do not want to have to go with your crop for next season. So you burn it. And it happens right at the end when the harvest has been brought in. And I just, I was like, whoa, wow. So God is not destroying the wicked yet. He's waiting for the end of the harvest. At the end of the harvest, then he'll destroy the, stub the stubble, but he's still gathering in people. So you'll see people in church who really don't look like they should be there. Maybe it's immaturity and give them some time. Pray for them. Maybe it's the devil's seed. Either way, you sh shouldn't be worried about it. Jesus wasn't worried about it. Jesus was in synagogue and there was a demon-possessed man right there. He didn't come in like, who among you is demon-possessed? No. He was just there, and then it revealed itself. It just manifested, and then he dealt with it. You don't need to be worried about trying to put God's kingdom in order. Just do what you were called to do. Let's move on. Okay, so verse 8. Moreover, dear friends, do not ignore this. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some people think of slowness, on the contrary, he is patient with you. For it is not his purpose that anyone should be destroyed, but that everyone should turn from his sins. So turn. God is giving you time to turn. I know it's tough. I know it's difficult. There's some things that you can't just stop doing. Because you keep telling yourself that was the last time and then it comes up again and you need God it's there's no other way it doesn't matter how much self-help books you read or how much counseling you get you need help you need prayer you need you need the Holy Spirit that is the only thing that can redeem you and cut off whatever hold it has over you you need God to set you free it is the only way there's many testimonies in this building that can tell you the same, that it was only when they cried out to God there was deliverance. There can be deliverance for you too. You don't have to live with it. You don't have to live with it. It can end like that. Okay. However, verse 10, sorry, hold on. Um,
Okay, so I just want to stress this a little bit more. Let me read that verse. So, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some people think of slowness. On the contrary, he is patient with you, for it is not his purpose that anyone should be destroyed, but that everyone should turn from his sins. You have a decision to make. It starts with your decision to turn. And if you want, I know people who can pray for you real quick and in a hurry and support you and walk with you. Don't stay in the dark. Your sin only has power when no one else knows about it. And it will continue to rule over you because it's in the dark. It doesn't matter how much you... Okay, you could pray and fast quite a bit, but the thing is, if you don't bring it into the light, it will still rule over you because there's no accountability. You need someone to keep you accountable who knows what you're struggling with. Otherwise, you'll just keep on struggling alone and justifying why it's okay. Because when the enemy comes in that hour, it's really difficult to resist. And unless you've got some warriors with you, it's like a lion against a pack of hyenas. It's alone. It's gonna get tired. And then they're gonna go for the kill. So we're here, we can pray with you, not going to expose anybody, but we're here. Just ask for prayer. All right. <clears throat> and we can even make it a private thing. We don't have to call every leader in, you know, just we're here. Let's move on. Verse 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will melt and disintegrate. The, and the earth and everything in it will be burned up. Now, this is the point of why we're reading this. Since everything is going to be destroyed like this, what kind of people should you be? I'll read it again. Since everything is going to be destroyed like this, what kind of people should you be? You should lead holy and godly lives as you wait for the day of God to work and, and work to hasten its coming. I'm not going to go on. You guys can study this in your private time because we're out of time. But the point is this. We are a body. And I don't think it's fair that some of you are struggling with things, whether it's sin, whether it's finances, whether it's transport, whatever it is, and we don't know. That's like my toe is like rotting or something and it doesn't send the message to my brain to say this hurts. That, that means something's wrong, right? If I put my hand on a stove that's on, and my hand doesn't tell me that this is hurting me and burning, there's a problem. How long do you think you can keep your hand on the stove without sending the message to the brain before your hand is useless? Yep. Two pizza chapter. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5 okay for this very reason try your hardest to furnish your faith with goodness goodness with knowledge knowledge with self-control self-control with perseverance perseverance with godliness godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for if you have these qualities in abundance they keep you from being barren and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Amen? Any comments? Any questions? Okay, let's pray.
Okay, after I pray, I'm gonna just say the blessing and then we can, we can go. Sure. Heavenly Father, we wanna thank you for your word. We bless you, God, because you are the one who has given us your word. You gave us the Torah, you gave us the prophets. You gave us leaders, Father, you gave us this body. And God, I trust that everybody in this place is here for a reason. Father, help us to step into our callings. Help us, Father, to realize where we fit in with the body. And I'm so grateful for those who have already started walking with you, God. I pray that we would not hide from you, that we would not hide sin from you, that we would not hide sin from one another. God, give us the courage to throw it away. Give us the courage to turn a new leaf, Lord God. Help us to repent. Help us to turn away from our sins because we need your Holy Spirit. Please give us the courage, God, the courage to come forward and to not hide because that is our natural condition, Father. When we've sinned, we just want to hide. But I pray that you help us to come out of hiding and to trust that you love us. You knew we were going to sin. You were there and you loved us anyways. So, Father, help us to realize that and to accept your love. Mighty God, I pray that this word would be a seed in the hearts of everybody here. I pray that it would be deeply rooted on good soil. Father, that it may bear much fruit. Help us to persevere. Help us to be open to correct each other. Help us, Father, to be open to your rebuke. In the name of Yeshua, may your Holy Spirit unite us and help us to preserve the peace that comes from that unity. Please bless the word, Father, in our lives and may it be abundant and fruitful, may it abide in us. And help us to guard our lips and to preserve the knowledge of your Torah. In the name of Yeshua, God, we thank you for everybody here. I just pray, God, if there's anybody who is struggling, who has a prayer that they can't articulate, I ask that you meet them at their need. I pray that you go before us, that you come behind us, and that, Father, you surround us in the name of Yeshua. Right. <clears throat> May Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai make his face shine on you and show you his favor. May Adonai lift up his face towards you and give you peace. Adonai <laughs> Isa Adonai panav leicha V'yasem lecha Shalom Amen <laughs>